And what we're looking at on this side is the double nature of Christ. But before we get into this, I want to just briefly look at the idea of idolatry, which I touched on on the last tape. And idolatry is simply the placing of anything or anybody before God in order of importance or degree of worship. Okay? In the Bible, we read about golden calves and these sorts of things, and they were worshipped. And God forbids that. But there's another type of idolatry, which is simply in one's mind and one's heart, making a person or a thing more important than God, our Heavenly Father. I'm going to read a quote that shows that even a Baptist catechism in the 1700s said that worshiping Jesus Christ to the extent that he's worshipped is idolatrous. It's idol an idolatrous practice. So I just want to introduce you to this. Now, I'm going to read a Mary Dana, and she is citing a Baptist catechism from the 1700s. And in case you're unfamiliar with what a catechism is, it's a question that is asked by an author, and the response is given by the same author. So the question is posed and the answer is supplied. And this is what uh, this Baptist catechism said. Now keep in mind, Baptists today are Trinitarian. And what we're going to see here is that in the 1700s, they weren't uniformly Trinitarian. And this is what that Baptist catechism says. The question is, can we be guilty of idolatry in worshiping Jesus Christ? The answer, yes, the majority of Christians are guilty of it by giving him the worship proper to the Father alone. They exceed the limit of God's command in this particular, whereby Jesus, who came to abolish idolatry, is made the greatest idol in the world. End quote. That's powerful. Jesus, who came to abolish idolatry, he came to lead people back to that one true God. He's been made the greatest idol in the world. And this is part and parcel of counterfeiting. Okay, the closer one gets to the original, the easier it is for people to believe that the, the counterfeit is the original. Now, Jesus Christ has not counterfeited himself. He's real and he's genuine. Others have made him in their minds to be God and co-equal with God. So, I just wanted to introduce you to that. And I'm going to read a quote from Dr. Farley on this particular. Sometimes the question is asked, well, why not make Jesus Christ God just to be on the safe side? Well, an obvious answer to that is that there is no safe side outside of truth. So Farley says this regarding that. But in saying all this, remember, I confess him only Lord to the glory of God the Father. I dare not say less, for there is his own emphatic declaration. Whosoever shall confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. How confess him if not in the very offices he claimed? I dare not say more. Assuredly, I dare not say that which shall seem as far as words can to dethrone God, something which shall seem to derogate from the essential, underived, unrivaled supremacy of the Father. I know that I am required to honor the Son even as I honor the Father, but in this connection I also know that I can honor the Father rightly and justly only by receiving and honoring the Son as his minister and representative in precisely those offices and relations in which it has pleased God to place and reveal him. I should dishonor God, nay, I should dishonor the Son by attempting anything more. End quote. And that's simple and straightforward. By calling somebody by a title which they have not been given, or placing them in an office which they have not been placed by God, is to dishonor that person. It's not to see them how they really are. And so, regarding this idea of idolatry, it's bumping Jesus Christ up into an office, into a level which he, he has not attained. He's not been given the office. He, he never was God. That simply couldn't be given to him. Now we proceed to look at the doctrine of the double nature of Christ. 
It's more theologically known as the hypostatic union. Jesus Christ is believed to be on the Trinitarian scheme both God and man, very God and very man, or 100% God and 100% man, and that these two natures were uh, eternally united and uh, indivisible at the time Jesus Christ was born of Mary. Okay, so fully the full manhood and the full godhood of Jesus Christ were inseparably united when he was born. Now, the need for this doctrine is that in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is clearly represented as a man. And there are things that are said of him that he was ignorant of. For example, we read in Mark 13, 32, of that day and hour, this is referring to Jesus Christ's return, of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the Son, neither the angels that are in heaven, but my Father only. All right, so Jesus is spoken of as uh, represented as being ignorant of the day of his return. We read in John 1.18, No man hath seen God at any time. Uh, John 14.28, My father is greater than I. So, there needs to be an argument presented to account for the clear representation in Scripture of Jesus Christ as a man and the fact that he was inferior. His own statements represented himself as being inferior to God. So an argument needed to be developed, otherwise the doctrine of the Trinity would fall. That there are three co-equal, co-eternal gods in the Godhead, that would fall. So this double nature of Christ is really the linchpin. It's the cornerstone of the doctrine of the Trinity. Because nobody denies that God the Father is God. All right? the, the Trinitarian is always trying to get back to Unitarianism. And that needs to be observed here, because... If Jesus Christ cannot be shown to be God Almighty as well, and the Holy Spirit cannot be shown to be God Almighty, then this doctrine of the Trinity falls. And the most emphasis is placed on the double nature of Christ because Jesus Christ is represented as clearly being a man in Scripture. So what we have is the need for this doctrine, the double nature of Christ. On the Trinitarian hypothesis, the terms Son of God and Son of Man are used to denote Jesus Christ in his two capacities or in his two natures. As Son of God, he is really God the Son. And as Son of Man, he is God the Man. All right? And so Jesus Christ is called God the God Man. He's called Jehovah Jesus by some. Uh, and this, this is the double nature of Christ. Now, the argument proceeds that whenever Jesus said something uh, that alluded to or explicitly stated his inferiority to God, it is simply said that he was speaking of his human nature, or he was speaking that as a man. So in John 14, 28, when Jesus said, My Father is greater than I, it is argued that Jesus said that as a man. My Father, God Almighty, is greater than me in my human capacity. And then the argument proceeds, but in my divine nature, as God the Son, uh, in my divine nature, God, of course, is not greater than me. I'm co-equal with him. Well, we can't help and stop here and just look and say, okay, if Jesus Christ is composed of these two natures, all right, let's say one is fully God, all right, that's perfect. Then the other part of his nature is fully man, and he's ignorant of anything. All right, He doesn't know the day that he's coming back. He says his father's greater than I in his human capacity. Well, even if we were to accept this double nature of Christ doctrine, it still shows us that Jesus Christ, in some capacity, is ignorant of something or not as great or powerful as the Father. So even if we were to allow this double nature of Christ and accept it. Even on the Trinitarian scheme, it still implies a subordination of Jesus Christ to the Father in some capacity. And if he's subordinate to God in any capacity, then he can't be God Almighty. He can't be God om omniscient, all-knowing, God omnipotent, all-powerful. It's evident even from this doctrine 
that Jesus Christ is subordinate to God and the supremacy of our Heavenly Father remains intact. Now, this doctrine, it violates the supremacy of God. Okay, We see in Scripture that the Father is clearly taught to be God. But never do we read, God the Son is to be worshipped. We never see that phrase in Scripture. I'm going to read a quote from Farley, who illustrates this point wonderfully. He says, on page 13, The frequency with which God is called or described as the Father is also in this connection to be borne in mind. In the New Testament, he is called simply the Father in no less than 122 passages. In 19, God the Father... In various places, God our Father, our Father, God even our Father, God even the Father, Father of mercies, Father of glory. He is declared in express terms to be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. While the Lord himself described him as your Father which is in heaven, thy Father, your heavenly Father, your Father, and after his resurrection directed Mary to say to his disciples, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Never in Scripture, not in one solitary instance, is there the phrase God the Son, which is so familiar to our ears that its profanity passes unnoticed. End quote. And that's true when we look at the scripture we see worship is ascribed to god the father constantly he's denoted as one god the father my you know jesus's father jesus always talked about his father even on the cross my god my god etc etc so we see it's constant and consistent throughout scripture old and new testament that god is supreme now this phrase god the son since we never see it in scripture is is proof all by itself that there is no such doctrine as God the Son. It is simply inferred from detached passages of Scripture that give to Jesus an exalted nature, okay, an exalted position. But what on the double nature of Christ and on the Trinitarian scheme happens is he is bumped up to being God instead of to being Lord and Christ. And this is where this double nature of Christ and principles of interpretation, which we'll, we'll, we'll get into more later, are violated. Very simply, the supremacy of God is a foundational text and understanding that we're to work out of. All of our principles of biblical interpretation are to work out of that fundamental principle. And what has happened is they are violated by raising Jesus Christ to the status of Godhood. Now, this doctrine of the double nature of Christ... That God is, uh, that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. In working with this, it's different than the doctrine of the Trinity, because the doctrine of the Trinity says that there are three persons in one nature. Right? There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and these three persons exist in one nature. The double nature of Christ says there are two natures existing in one person. So we have a reversal of like, a reversal of logic, I suppose. God is three persons in one nature. Jesus is two natures in one person. And so, you know, on the Trinitarian scheme, there's not even a consistency about uh, of the way we speak about people. Okay, God is three persons. That can't be explained. It's a divine mystery. And Jesus Christ has a, a, a dual nature. And we're going to see how... That really makes our Lord look very silly and foolish in many situations if we accept this doctrine. I'm going to read a quote from uh, Hindman, and he says this, How inconsistent are Trinitarians, not only with Scripture, but with themselves? While the statements of their doctrine respecting the Trinity imply that three persons constitute but one nature, in the hypostatic union we find two natures constituting but one person. End quote. And this is commonly understood that there's an inconsistency going on here. And it gets back to the use, uh, the usage of the word persons. The Trinitarian cannot explain what he means by the word persons. Three persons existing in one nature. And then Jesus Christ has two natures existing in one person. Well, these terms are never even defined. They're, never, they're not delimited so that we could understand what the natural boundaries of the concept of the word person is. 
Because when I speak of myself as a person, I know what I mean. When I speak of somebody else as a person, you know, whether it's Michael Jordan on the basketball court or the Queen of England, I know whom I'm speaking about. It's one person. I don't speak about their nature in this way or that way. I just talk about them as a person. Now, on the Trinitarian scheme, though, definitions are not even given. They're suggested uh, as to what this word persons means, but what we clearly see is that there's no fixed definition that we can go by so we could even understand what it is when someone says there are three persons in one nature or two natures in one person because we simply don't talk that way. Now I'm going to read a quote from Dr. Farley and he says regarding the double nature of Christ as compared to the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, Remember, there are two different claims. He says, as before of the doctrine of the Trinity, so now of the doctrine of the hypostatic union, as it is called, I ask for a single hint throughout the New Testament of the inconceivable fact that in the body of Jesus resided the mind of God and the mind of man, two natures, the one finite, the other infinite, yet making but one person, a difficulty you will perceive the very opposite of that of the Trinity. For whereas that teaches three persons in one nature, this teaches two natures in one person." End quote. And so there we have it. Ask yourself if you see a, a hint of the, the, this inconceivable idea to our minds that in the body of a man could, could exist the mind of God and the mind of man. One's finite, one's infinite. Yet Jesus Christ is said to be very God, all right, 100% God and 100% man. And they're, they're opposite. You know, one's finite, the other's infinite. So <laughs> just when you read the Bible, think about that. Now I'm going to read a quote here regarding this being a doctrine of inference. Because clearly there's nothing in the New Testament or the Old that tells us that in the mind of Jesus Christ or in the body of Jesus Christ existed two complete and separate and different natures existing in one person. And what we do see is that Jesus is the Son of God. In his complete self, he's called the Son of God, the Anointed, the Scent of God. Con constantly we we read terms like this applied to him, but never do we see that he's got two natures. I'm now going to read a quote from Charles Morgridge, and he starts with a quote from Professor Stewart, who's a Trinitarian, and then goes on to comment on it. Morgridge says this, Professor Stewart, speaking of Jesus Christ, says, quote, He must, as it seems to me, be God omniscient and omnipotent, and still a feeble man of imperfect knowledge. End quote. Now, Morgridge comments, Now, this doctrine is to be rejected because, like that of the Trinity, it is essentially incredible. It is not a mystery, but as palpable a contradiction as can be stated. By the nature of anything or being is always meant his essential qualities. If Christ possesses a divine and human nature, he must possess the essential qualities of God and the distinctive qualities of man. But these qualities are totally incompatible with one another. To assert that the same mind possesses both a human and a divine nature is to assert that the same mind is both created and uncreated, both finite and infinite, both dependent and independent, both mutable and immutable, both mortal and immortal, both susceptible of pain and unsusceptible of it, both able to do all things and unable, both acquainted with all things and not acquainted with them, both ignorant of some things and possessed of the most intimate knowledge of them, both in all places and only in one place at the same time. Now, if this doctrine is not an absurdity, I know not how to conceive or, uh, or describe an absurdity. It is not pretended that any passage of Scripture expressly asserts the doctrine of the two natures. Like that of the Trinity, it is a mere inference from the premises laid down by Trinitarians. End quote. So, what he's saying here is that for Jesus Christ to have two natures, okay, to be 100% God and to be 100% man is to express a contradiction. Because to be 100% God says that you're fully acquainted with everything. And to be man is to say that you're limited. You're not fully acquainted with everything. So to say that the same thing, the same nature, uh, two different natures, 
are in the same person is to really make Jesus one a schizophrenic. But if you don't accept that he's a schizophrenic, which I don't, you must just simply say, this is an absurdity. It's ridiculous. When Jesus said uh, of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the son, but the father only, he really meant that. <laughs> okay? And that's what happens with this double nature of Christ doctrine, is that any of Jesus' words can be dismissed on this double nature. All Jesus could have come out and said, I'm not God, I'm not God, I'm not God. You people are going to make me God, but I'm not God, I'll never be God. And later people can just say, you know what? He said that as a man, but we know that as God, he's really God. Well, draw your own conclusions from this, but you can see where when you look at this doctrine just a little bit, you can see where it just falls apart. With the hypostatic union or this double nature, when Jesus said, my father is greater than I, well, on the Unitarian scheme, and really what is being communicated to us is very simply that my father is greater than me, all of me. When, when I talk about me, I'm talking about all of me. This is the common usage. When I talk about you or when you talk about me or you talk about yourself, it's talking about all of you, not just half of you. And so on this double nature of Christ, when Jesus says, my father is greater than I, what's really being said, on the, on, according to this doctrine, is my father is greater than half of me. Of course, he's not greater than the other half. But then again, the Trinitarian falls according to his own logic because if God is greater than Jesus Christ in any capacity, he's simply greater than Jesus Christ. The idea of co-equality is out the window. So bear in mind when you read the Bible that it was written to the common man and the common woman, the common person, so that even children would understand this. If a child picked the Bible up at age seven and started to read it, it was written for him or her to understand it. Now there's no way when a child picks a Bible up and says, my father is greater than I, that he or she is going to be able in any way to infer from that, that it really means my father's greater than half of me. The other half is equal with him, of course. This half is not. But when we look at the whole thing, it really means I'm equal with my father. All right? No, no logician, no child, no anybody would and should proceed in that manner with this doctrine. But that's what necessarily arises from it. And I'm going to read a quote from uh, Burnap here. And Burnap says this regarding speaking in common sense language and that even the Bible is a common sense book. He says, It is a law of veracity laid down in the most common books which treat of moral obligation that to speak the truth, you must say that which is true in the sense in which you know you will be understood by your hearers. To say that which without further explanation will mislead your hearers without giving the explanation is to equivocate. End quote. And this is simple. This is the way we speak. When I, I speak, I speak in the way that I know I'm going to be understood. If I sense that there's going to be a chance of being misunderstood, I clear it up on the spot so that there's no room for being misunderstood. Yet when Jesus said, my father is greater than I, he gave no explanation. So it's clear that he was speaking to a vast audience, okay, you know, millions of people afterwards that would get born again, and his words, even immediately were addressed to those around him, were understood in the common sense that that phrase is understood. My father's greater than I. It's very simple and it's very straightforward. And Jesus spoke with the understanding that he had to get a message across to the people. So to think that our Lord would be speaking about his double nature, his human nature in that verse, is, is to not take our, word, our Lord's words in their simplest meaning. And you could clearly see why this doctrine of the double nature of Christ didn't come about at its earliest date at 325 AD. It needed hundreds of years to, to develop because it's so easy to argue against it, especially at its inception. Now we've had about 1,700 years for this doctrine to develop, so there are more responses to the challenges made against it. 
But clearly you could see this is a doctrine that developed over time because it's a doctrine of inference from a detached verse here in Scripture, a detached verse there in Scripture, put together, inference is made, and then the doctrine sort of gained a head of steam that way. But simply when Jesus said, my father is greater than I, that's exactly what he meant. And so this doctrine of the double nature turns scripture into confusion. And because we see a simple statement like, my father is greater than I, and yet on the Trinitarian scheme, it is taken to mean something entirely different than what we come to understand our Lord to mean. Now I'm going to read a quote from Andrews Norton regarding this, and he says, According to those who maintain the doctrine of the two natures in Christ, Christ speaks of himself and is spoken of by his apostles, sometimes as a man, sometimes as God, and sometimes as both God and man. He speaks and is spoken of under these different characters indiscriminately, without any explanation, and without its being anywhere declared that he existed in these different conditions of being. He prays to that being whom he himself was. He declares himself to be ignorant of what he knew and unable to perform what he could perform. If my readers are shocked by the combinations which I have brought together, I beg them to do me the justice to believe that my feelings are the same with their own. But these combinations necessarily result from the doctrine which we are considering. Page after page might be filled with inconsistencies as gross and as glaring. The doctrine has turned the scriptures, as far as they relate to this subject, into a book of riddles and, what is worse, of riddles admitting of no solution. I willingly refrain from the use of that stronger language which will occur to many of my readers." End quote. And that's right. It, there's no warning given, there's no explanation that Jesus was speaking you know, that Jesus gives us, that he's speaking in his human nature or in his godly nature, we're, we're left to infer this ourselves, I, I guess, according to as we see fit. And so the Bible becomes a book of riddles. And what he says is it becomes, it, what's even worse, of riddles admitting of no solution. And that's simple when we look. Goodness. You know, the Bible's written that the wayfaring man, though ignorant, need not err therein. And there are so many people that would err therein on this, <laughs> in, in, on this doctrine. And it's for the simple reason that it conflicts with just principles of interpretation. When we read the Bible, there are principles of interpretation, there are rules of language that we go by. I'm going to read a quote from uh, Dr. Farley, and we're going to get more into rules of interpretation later and how the doctrine of the Trinity and the double nature of Christ are in direct violation of almost all the rules of, uh, of interpretation. But I'll introduce you to a bit of it now relating to the double nature of Christ. Dr. Farley says this, For the obvious principle that Scripture is to be interpreted like any other book, we have the high orthodox authority of Professor Stewart and of other orthodox critics of equal eminence with him. If there be, Professor Stewart says, any book on earth that is addressed to the reason and common sense of mankind, the Bible is preeminently that book. If the Bible is not a book which is intelligible in the same way as other books are, then it is difficult to see how it is a revelation. End quote. And then Morgridge goes on. He says, These principles and the rule they involve are inevitably violated by this hypothesis of the double nature of Christ. By its admission, the Bible cannot be interpreted like other books. Plain language in other books is taken in its plain significance. But here the plainest becomes a riddle. When our Lord says, My Father is greater than I, he meant only that his divine nature was greater than his human nature. But who can prove that he so meant? Neither he nor his disciples give the slightest reason to suppose that he or they meant anything but what their words obviously mean. Besides, we cannot tell when to apply the hypothesis. We are all in the dark, and the scripture may be made to mean by it the most contradictory things. Whatever Christ said or did may thus be done away, and the entire New Testament become a massive enigma. End quote. And that is something that needs to be understood, is that, and, and this is what I see is, is a problem in Christianity, period, is that the Bible is not read like any other book. All right, God was the author of language. He had holy men of God that were inspired, right? And 
r the written language, God being the author of it, we are made to understand it. And so when we read the Bible, we're to take it in its obvious sense. So a statement as simple as, my father is greater than I, is to be taken in its obvious sense, just as when we would read any other book. But with this double nature of Christ, what happens is, and as I mentioned, this happens all too frequently, the Bible becomes this ethereal sort of book that people voluntarily place out of their own realm of comprehension. And that's a tragedy. It really is, because the Bible simply makes sense. That's exactly what we would expect from a wise God such as ours. So to think that any, you know, all these riddles are involved in trying to understand God, well, that's just, that's so common, I guess, among, uh, among men and people where God has made a mystery. Oh, he's so mysterious. And then we take that attitude into reading the scriptures, yet the scripture is there so that even the most basic person could read and understand it. And a gentleman who understood this very well is uh, Eliot. And I'm going to read a quote from him. He says this, We find no fault with those who are satisfied with this answer, but it does not satisfy us. It does not seem to us the fair interpretation of plain language. For first, we find no passage in the Bible, and there is none, in which it is taught that our Savior had two natures, one human and one divine. But he is always spoken of as a single being, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And secondly, we think that when he spoke of himself without qualification, using the personal pronouns I and myself and me, he must have used them in their common meaning, and he was certainly at the time so understood. If he had intended to have been understood differently, he would have given some indication of it. As he gave none, we take his words in their plain and obvious meaning. End quote. And, there, and that's right. I mean, it's just so plain and simple. When you pick your Bible up and read the pages and read the texts, it's written like any other book, except authored, you know, by holy men of God who were moved by God to write. So these are divinely inspired words that we're reading, but yet they're words that are to be understood in their common sense. Now, regarding our salvation as relates to this double nature of Christ, I want to point out how inconsistent this doctrine of the double nature of Christ is with a primary tenet of Trinitarianism, which is that God had to die for our sins because sin is infinite and we need an infinite atonement for our sins. Well, the double nature of Christ says that Jesus Christ had two natures, one God, one man. The man was here on earth while the double nature lived on somewhere else, which is how Jesus could say, my father is greater than I, and yet he could still be God somehow. So Jesus Christ was here as a man on earth and was crucified as a man. And yet somehow this godly nature of his still lived on. And what we see is that he died as a man, which conflicts directly with the primary tenet of Trinitarianism, that God had to die for our sins. And another thing must be observed is that if God truly had to die for our sins, right? which is amazing to me to think that God is responsible for our sins, but be that as it may, if God had to die for our sins, since God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three of those must would have had to have been in the tomb and been crucified on the cross and put in to that tomb. And it, it had to be a real, complete death, just as the Passover lamb of Israel. You know, the lamb every year the priest had to sacrifice to make atonement for the people once a year. Well, Jesus Christ did that once. But we see how the doctrines don't even work together because... God exists in three persons. Well, two of the persons were still living on in heaven. In fact, half of the other one was still living on in heaven or wherever. And half of Jesus Christ, okay, his human nature was in the tomb, which disagrees with the idea that God had to die for our sins. So that, you know, it's hard to see how our salvation has been accomplished yet because death wasn't truly a reality. Uh, you know, when Jesus was crucified. It was more like a, a wound or something. I'm going to read a quote from Sir Anthony Buzzard and Charles Hunting on this. And they say this, 
A comparable difficulty faces Trinitarians when they assert that only the human part of Jesus died. If Jesus were God, and God is immortal, Jesus could not have died. We wonder how it is possible to maintain that Jesus does not represent the whole person. Nothing in the Bible suggests that Jesus is the name of his human nature only. If Jesus is the whole person and Jesus died, he cannot be a mortal deity. It appears that Trinitarians argue that only deity is sufficient to provide the necessary atonement. But if the divine nature did not die, how on the Trinitarian theory is the atonement secured? End quote. And there it is. It is asserted that only the human nature died, but the divine nature lived on. Well then, the whole person of Jesus didn't die, and our salvation has not yet been secured. Now, in looking at the various tenets and propositions of this double nature of Christ, firstly, let's just look at the term double nature, and that it's an absurd term, okay? It's, it's tantamount to Jesus having a split personality. You know, if I talk about a friend of mine saying, yeah, he's got two natures, well, that really makes the guy look like he's nuts, you know? But generally when I speak about my friend, I'll say, yeah, he's a nice guy. Or he's, you know, he's a good ball player or whatever. You know, I'll talk about him in his whole capacity. But I don't sp speak about him in this nature and that nature. That's simply not the way we talk. So this idea of double nature, and I'll read something of, some things about this later, really suggests that Jesus has two personalities. And that, that's silly. And what it also suggests is that Jesus is a liar. Because when Jesus said, my father is greater than I, the Trinitarian says, Jesus Christ is every bit as equal with the Father. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. That's the doctrine of the double nature of Christ. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. And because he's God, he's omniscient and omnipotent and the creator of the universe and everything else. Well, that makes Jesus a liar. Very simply. I'm going to read a quote. And uh, Charles Morgridge illustrates this point very nicely. He says, but an, but an objection of a graver character lies against the doctrine of the two natures. It implicates the moral character of the holy Jesus. It impeaches his veracity and exposes him to the charge of equivocation, duplicity, and falsehood. These are weighty charges, and we cannot endure for a moment an hypothesis which throws suspicion of dishonesty upon our blessed Savior. Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. The Trinitarian says, Jesus can of himself do everything that God can do. Jesus said, my father is greater than I. The Trinitarian says, Jesus is as great as the father. Now, Morgage is going to go on and illustrate how absurd that notion is and how it really would make Jesus a liar. And he's going to do this by an illustration. He says, suppose a man should be asked to subscribe his name to a written instrument and that he should refuse to do it, saying, I cannot write, I cannot wield the pen, I never learn to write. Suppose it should be known that this man could write, that an explanation should be demanded, and that he should say, he only meant that he could not write with his left hand, though he could use the pen with his right hand as well as any man. Would not such a man subject himself to the charge of equivocation, duplicity, and falsehood? End quote. In other words, wouldn't that man be a liar? If somebody said, I can't write, and then later it was found out that the person could write, and he were to say, well, I can't write with my left hand, but I can with my right hand, well, that person you'd say is a liar, because when he says, I can't write, he's speaking about in all what comprises or composes that man, he cannot write. So when Jesus said, my father's greater than I, or I can of mine own self do nothing, well, we take Jesus' words. The double nature of Christ says, Jesus Christ can do everything God can do. Or my Father's not greater than I am equal with God. And that's the problem here, is that the veracity of our Lord Jesus Christ is at stake. We can't even trust his own words. I'm going to read from uh, Morgridge. I'm going to continue. He says, Jesus is said to have two capacities of knowledge, his divine and his human nature. The one is strong and piercing, knowing all things. The other is weak and defective, being ignorant of many things. As such an one, he says, in regard to the day of a certain event, he does not know the day nor the hour. 
He makes no exception of one of his capacities of knowledge, but says absolutely he does not know the time. End quote. And there, there that's right, because Jesus said, I don't know the hour. And Trinitarian says, Jesus knows the hour. He's God. Of course he knows the hour. And this is what happens when people form arguments that are not based on Scripture. And you can see eventually down the road how the, the arguments that engender other arguments and other arguments and other arguments, the end product is an absolutely absurd contradiction against the clear, explicit language of Scripture. Now, this doctrine of the double nature of Christ makes Jesus deceitful, okay? And I'm going to read from Farley now, and he illustrates it beautifully about how it makes Jesus' words unbelievable. We cannot believe them. We can't trust them if we accept this double nature of Christ doctrine. And he says this, Regarding it, then, as the merest hypothesis, its admission makes difficulty where there is none, renders vague or obscure the plainest and most explicit language of Scripture. It demands on its face the surrender of reason. It involves positive absurdity. Divine and human qualities, as the essence of being, cannot coexist in the same person. God is infinite, man is finite, and no being can be at once and essentially finite and infinite. It has stops inquiry by its plea of mystery and drives us, would we believe it, to the old position of Tertullian, I believe because it is impossible. It destroys Christ's unity and makes him two distinct and opposite beings. That Christ is both God and man is a proposition plain enough in its statement, but the two predicates are incompatible. And how should we have understood him had we been present? How did the apostles, how did the multitude who were present, understand him at the time? They must have understood him as we do to have made a positive express declaration that of that day and hour he had no knowledge. And therefore to suppose that he made a mental reservation as to his divine knowledge, while he declared only his human lack of it, is to charge him with duplicity, with double dealing, with deceit. End quote. Sure. It absolutely does that, because when Jesus said of that day and hour, I don't know, and he told the people, I don't know, how would they have understood him? How did they understand him? He didn't come out and, and let them know, there's this other part of me that knows it. What you're seeing right now is just part of me. No. When he said, I don't know it, he meant, I don't know it. And it's a shame that I even have to come out and argue this point, because if we're to take anybody's words about God Almighty, it would be our Lord Jesus Christ's words. And what does Jesus say about God Almighty? My Father's greater than I. Well, the established law of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is alive and well in the New Testament, and Jesus Christ reaffirmed it. But, like we read before, Jesus Christ may be the biggest idol in the world today. He came to abolish idolatry as best as he could, and people are drawn to him and make him the idol. And the people who make him an idol are Christians. And no wonder Christianity is not as effective as it could be and should be. You know, our, you know, so many people's minds have been given over to just believing what I call a fable. Believe, you know, we're to believe Jesus' words, and especially as they relate to God Almighty. That's where, you know, we're to get our knowledge about God from. We're continuing to look at the double nature of Christ and its implications. And what we're going to look at now is how this doctrine of the double nature really makes Jesus two people. All right? In the same way that the doctrine of the Trinity makes three gods, you know, three gods in one person or three persons in one God, and... Since it's never been explained to anyone's satisfaction how that could be, we simply take the words in their obvious meaning. Well, when we look at the double nature of Christ, we're left with the clear understanding that Jesus Christ is really made to be two people. Not one, but two. 100% God, 100% man. Very God, very man. He, You know, two people. I'm going to read a quote from James Gifford, and he says this, 
He says, this must be allowed by those who, to solve the difficulties which Scripture presents against their system, so often insist on the two natures complete in Christ, the divine and human. But they do not seem to reflect that. If they were pressed on this article, they would find themselves driven to maintain that Jesus Christ is not one, but two persons or intelligent agents. This was the doctrine of Nestorius, condemned and anathematized in the Council of Ephesus, at which more than 200 bishops assisted. End quote. So what we see here is that this idea has actually been presented to the church, the Orthodox Church. Hundreds, hundreds, you know, about 17, 1600 years ago, and Nestorius was anathematized and condemned. And yet today, the very same doctrine is presented that Jesus Christ really is two persons. Because if we study one, one is completely God knows everything. The other is completely man and doesn't know everything. We've got a clear statement that there are two minds being represented here. And this is how this double nature of Christ makes Jesus Christ really two people. And this is something that had been addressed by the church and ruled out as a possibility. And But we can see the effects of time. Okay, given enough time, you know, this is just one of those adages that you hear, you may hear on occasion, that if a lie is told long enough and loud enough, people will believe it. And this doctrine of the Trinity and the double nature of Christ certainly has had enough time to be shouted from the rooftops <laughs> and get people to believe it. You know, the, the translations of the Bible have been in the hands of Trinitarians, and so corruptions of text, corruptions of texts have been introduced, forgeries. And so over time, tell something long enough and loudly enough and even make people feel real badly if they don't believe it and make them feel stupid and kick them out of your church and put these sorts of pressures, and people will believe it. Uh, just because in many ways it's easier not to fight in, in this way. But nonetheless, we're looking at the horrifying implications of the double nature of Christ and what the doctrine implies. And I'm going to read a quote from Dr. Farley, and he says this, But on this hypothesis of the double nature of Christ, what mean all his declarations of dependence on God? Of mine own self I can do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Just as he had before said, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. What mean his expressions of trust in God? He said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. To whom were these words addressed? To whom was he accustomed to pray? To one part of his nature? To himself? To a part of himself? What mockery all this seems! End quote. And there it is. You know, it really makes Jesus deceitful. It makes it foolish. Jesus went and prayed. And who did he pray to? Firstly, if he, if he were God, what need did he have to pray? And secondly, if he was fully God and fully man, who was he praying to? To himself? And is that a model for us to follow? So not only does it make Jesus' words, you know, unbelievable and in many ways meaningless, it also affects our understanding of Scripture. You know, how can we understand anything written in Scripture if words could be meant at one time to mean this and in another time to mean something entirely different? Suppose we began to apply this principle of interpretation to other people. Well, maybe Paul, maybe Paul had two natures. Maybe sometimes when he spoke, he spoke as a Jew denying Christ, and other times he spoke as a Christian accepting Christ as his Messiah. How do we know when he said anything or when he meant anything? And the same might be multiplied throughout Scripture, and we could see that a rule of interpretation must be established that we take things in their simplest, obvious import where it agrees with the bulk and body of Scripture and what has been established. And the fundamental principle that is established that all our understanding of the New Testament is to be based on is that God is one and He is supreme, and He's our Heavenly Father. So this doctrine of the double nature and the doctrine of the Trinity just violates our common sense approach to Scripture. And here's another one of the, the just horrifying implications of these doctrines. Morgridge says this, If instead of saying, My Father is greater than I, Jesus had said, I'm not so great as my Father. I am not equal with the Father. I am not God. I am not equal with God. 
We have only to say, this he spoke as man, hence it is not true, in order to set his testimony concerning himself aside. Now can a doctrine be admitted which renders his plainest sayings unintelligible and makes it absolutely impossible for him to deny that he is God if he had a mind to do so? End quote. And this is what we see here, is that it doesn't matter what Jesus said. It can simply be laid aside. If we don't agree with it, we just simply throw it out and say, nope, he spoke that as man. Well, you know, when Jesus said, my father is greater than I, if that statement is not true, he's a liar. And, you know, this doctrine, these doctrines have got to be seen and understood for what they are. It not only impeaches the the supremacy of God, our Heavenly Father, but it also turns Jesus' words into lies. We can, and also gives us the authority to simply dismiss anything the Messiah said. And that's what they did when he was walking the earth. So many people, dis so, thank God, so many accepted him, but so many rejected him. They rejected his words. They rejected the truth about him. And that's exactly what's happening here on, in today in this modern era where Christianity, you know, Christendom, about 90% believe this doctrine of the Trinity. They're denying Jesus' words. And if any words of Jesus are to be denied, they're not to be the simplest and most obvious ones. Let's go for the difficult ones. If you want to reject them at your own peril, do it. But not the simple ones. Because, gosh, once we establish a, a, a practice of biblical interpretation, denying the simple, obvious meanings in Scripture, what, what happens when we get to the difficult verses? My gosh, it's so much easier for us to dismiss them or make them mean what we want them to say. But the obvious ones have got to be kept intact. Jesus is not a liar. You know, how about Jesus' prayers? What do they mean? What possible significance could they have to us as an example if he were God? If he, we, what, were we praying to himself? I mean, I'm going to read a quote from Mortgage on this very subject about making Jesus a liar and, and, and Jesus Christ's example being no example to us whatsoever if he was truly God. Mortgage says this, we object to the doctrine of the two natures because it would, if admitted, deprive us of the comforts and advantages arising from the example of Christ's prayers and sufferings. In commenting on the secret morning prayer of Jesus in Mark 1.35, Dr. Adam Clark, in his great zeal for the doctrine of the two natures, says, Not that Jesus needed anything, for in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but that he might be a pattern to us. End quote. Margaret goes on. If the learned doctor be correct, Jesus must have asked his heavenly father for innum innumerable blessings which he did not need, that he might be a pattern to us. But how can we imitate such a pattern without praying for such things as we do not need? If Jesus is God, he must have prayed to himself. But of what benefit to us can such an example be? What comfort or instruction can be derived from contemplating the prayers of Jesus if every prayer he offered was addressed to himself and he was so independent that he needed nothing? Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Was all this only to set us an example? What sympathy can we feel with the sufferer? Prayer is an expression of dependence and want. If a person who needs nothing prays, is it not mere pretense? Is it not hypocrisy? End quote. Absolutely, that's what we see. If Jesus needed nothing and he prayed, and it's been admitted even by the Dr. Adam Clark, he was an eminent Trinitarian, that Jesus didn't need anything, but he only prayed that it would be a pattern to us. Well, what sort of pattern would that be to us if we need... <laughs> Okay, so the pattern for us is that when we don't need anything, we should pray. That's the pattern that's established, and that's foolishness. Jesus needed things. He needed fellowship with God Almighty, with his Father, and he took advantage of that constantly. He wasn't talking to himself. If words mean anything, Jesus' Father is Jesus' Father, not his co-equal, co-eternal buddy. It's his Father. Now, I'm going to read a quote of a Trinitarian, Dr. Garrett Verkeil, in his work, Reclaim Those Unitarian Wastes. 
And he says this, and what I'm looking at here is the idea that God becomes a schizophrenic on this scheme of three and one, and that Jesus Christ is even a schizophrenic with a two and one idea. All right? God's one person. He's our Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ is his own person. He's one. He's our Lord. But when we begin to make these three and one and two and one explanations, we begin to introduce multiple personalities. And I'm going to read a quote from a Trinitarian who says this very thing. Dr. Verkyle says this, The more one studies the work of the Holy Spirit compared to that of God as Jehovah or as the Almighty, the more one grows convinced of a divine being that overflows the bounds of single personality. End quote. So the more we study this thing, the more we become convinced of, how does he put it, a being that overflows the bounds of single personality. So indeed, we've got dual personalities here, or tri-personalities. And isn't it simpler just to simply say, Jesus Christ is our Lord, God our Heavenly Father is our God. Now I'm going to read a quote about mediation. And in 1 Timothy 2.5, we read that there is but one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, what this is after Jesus Christ's ascension. He's still called a man, as you'll, you'll notice. And we'll see more verses later that say that. But this one's clear. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And he's called the mediator, Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus Christ is God himself, there's no need for mediation. This concept of mediation goes right out the window. I'm going to read from Mary Dana a short quote, and she says this. Now I ask, is he a mediator in his divine or in his human nature? If in his human, he cannot, according to your Trinitarian ideas, know what all God's creatures want and pray for. If he mediates in his divine nature or in both united, then he mediates with himself. End quote. And that's a marvelous point here is that we've got to look. Is Jesus mediating in his capacity as a man? Or is he mediating in his capacity as God? Well, we see there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So he's mediating as a man. But if we say that he's the God-man, making him fully God, then the idea of mediation disappears because then he's mediating with himself which is not mediation. So it really does turn the scripture into confusion. For us, it makes Jesus' words unbelievable. It turns Paul's words into unintelligible statements. Now, regarding our Lord Jesus Christ, it is asserted that Unitarians don't make enough of him. We, we tear him down because we don't make him God. But that's simply not true. We take his words in their obvious significance. We most assuredly, as I said earlier in the seminar, in the introduction, believe that Jesus Christ is divine. But there's a big difference between being divine and being God Almighty. To be divine is to be godlike. It's simply to imitate God, which is what we're called to do in Scripture. Be as much like God as we can in terms of manifesting his goodness, his love, his power. All these wonderful attributes of God were to manifest. God is the originator of all good things. All good gifts come down from the, you know, our Heavenly Father. He doesn't change. So whatever goodness we manifest is attributed to God. He's given, and we'll get into this later, but he's given us power from on high, which is Holy Spirit, to accomplish this. So to be divine does not make one God. And we assuredly believe that Jesus Christ was divine. He manifested God's goodness to such a great extent that he was even an acceptable sacrifice unto God. That's incredible. I'm going to read a quote regarding our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, keep in mind, he's divine, he's just not God. I'm going to read a quote from Morgridge. He says this, A definition of the word divinity is a state of being divine or godlike. In this sense of the word, we speak of the divinity of the scriptures, meaning that they came from God. 
According to this interpretation of the phrase, also, we firmly believe in the divinity of Christ. We believe in the divinity of his person and nature, because he is the Son of God. If every son is the image and likeness of his Father, and if Jesus is God's own Son, he must be divine or godlike. If we believed him not to be divine, we should also believe him not to be the Son of God, but the Son of Joseph, or some other man. End quote. And that's right. We believe in the divinity of what Jesus did, the divinity of his doctrine that he taught, the doctrines of love, But it, because it didn't originate from himself, it came from God. We believe in the divinity of his office, because his office as, a, as the Messiah didn't originate from him. It wasn't established by human authority. It came from God, <laughs> from, from the throne of God. We believe in the divinity of his mission because God sent him. There's so much about Jesus Christ that is divine, but that doesn't make him God. It makes him divine. It makes him godly or godlike. And we're to aspire to be like Jesus Christ because he was godly and is godly but certainly not God. We read that clearly established in Scripture. Now, Jesus, of course, in his mission and all that he accomplished, represented God. And as a representative of God, as only doing the Father's will and only doing what he learned of the Father, he spoke consistently by inspiration or revelation. And I'm going to read a quote on this from Thomas. And he says this, T.F. Thomas, we do think that the doctrine of our Lord's two natures actually impeaches his veracity. What scope it affords for tampering with his words? For if there be a particular moral precept which may not accord with a man's desire and judgment, can he not escape the applying such an injunction by saying that it was evidently spoken by our Lord in his human capacity and not in his divine nature? Thanks be to God, Unitarians entertain no such views of their Savior, but maintain that he always spoke under divine inspiration. End quote. And there's the difference between this double nature of Christ on the Trinitarian scheme and what Unitarians believe is that we believe that Jesus always spoke under divine inspiration. Always. There wasn't a single word that we could set aside as not having come from God himself by inspiration or revelation. Jesus Christ's words are to be relied upon and counted upon because they originated in God. God revealed them to him. We see that even in Revelation 1.1, the revelation which God gave unto Jesus Christ, and then Jesus Christ sent and signified it by an angel unto a servant John. You know, God was constantly revealing things to Jesus Christ to do and to say, to heal, to be who he was and who he is now. And so we are called to believe his words. John Milton says this in his treatise on Christian doctrine. But here perhaps the advocates of the contrary opinion will interpose with the same argument which was advanced before. For they are constantly shifting the form of their reasoning and using the twofold nature of Christ developed in his office as a mediator as a ready subterfuge by which to evade any arguments that may be brought against them. What scripture says of the Son generally, they apply as suits their purpose in a partial and restricted sense. At one time as the Son of God, at another to the Son of Man, now to the mediator in his divine, now in his human capacity, and now again in his union of both natures. End quote. And he illustrates right there absolutely the right point regarding this double nature of Christ. In addressing the issue when Jesus has said, my father is greater than I, well, that's just applied in a restricted sense. Jesus only meant it in a restricted sense, only in his capacity as a man. And then at other times it said that Jesus was speaking as God, like I and my father are one in John 10.30. So, so he's saying, I and my father are one. I'm God. I'm part of God. I'm in the Godhead. So in that sense, he's spoken of saying that as God. And there's no hint given, but as suits the Trinitarian purpose or theme and maintains the development of Trinitarian thought, 
In one sense, Jesus is spoken of as being a man. In others, he's spoken of as being God. And there's n and sometimes he's spoken of as being both God and man at the same time. We're never told when in Scripture. We're just left to, you know, pick this out. So many arguments have been brought forward in defense of this doctrine of the Trinity and in defense of this double nature of Christ. We've seen where they disagree with one another, the two doctrines, because when we see Jesus saying something like, my father is greater than I, but on the double nature of Christ theory, it really means my father is greater than half of me, then and then it's asserted somehow from that that, well, we get from this argument that Jesus Christ is equal with God. Well, what we see is this theory of the double nature of Christ and the Trinity. People are going to great lengths, whatever extent they can, whatever jumble of words they can come up with, to save this theory from falling. And when we see in Scripture, our Lord Jesus Christ is our example to follow. When he speaks and, that, and he prays, that those are patterns to us to follow we need to pray for things that we need we need to pray for things that other people need we need to talk to god genuinely as god and use jesus christ as our example and our model in that and jesus also told us that he came not to do his own will but the will of the father that sent him and that's exactly the model that we're to follow to do the will of the father that sent jesus christ uh, Jesus sent us into the world as well. Just as Jesus received the commission from the Father, we receive one from Jesus Christ. Jesus is our example. He led us to God. We've got to be godly and follow Jesus Christ's example. If Jesus Christ has got two natures in one person or two persons in one nature, there's no example that we can follow. So let's stick to the strict, simple understanding, obvious meaning of Scripture, especially when Jesus spoke the words he spoke.